I don't necessarily agree with an owner coming out and just ripping a player like that, but he's also ripping himself. It's had scoop time with Ken Rosenthal, our FT senior insider, who put out 10 major questions for the postseason this morning in The Athletic. Ken, great to see you and happy postseason. So let's focus on some of the teams that are playing tonight. I know obviously there's Otani and Judge and some others in there that get a nice little cozy bye week and we'll see what happens. But I'd like to start with the San Diego Padres. They haven't won a World Series. I don't think many people peg them to be a World Series champ this year. So can you give us a little bit on what you wrote about with San Diego? Basically, Scott, they look like perhaps the most complete team in the tournament right now. And when I say that, I mean their lineup is deep. Their starting rotation, they're going to go King, Musgrove, and Cease is very good. And their bullpen, which they fortified at the deadline, is, again, one of the best in the game. You never know what's going to happen in the postseason. Of course, we all know that. But they look very well positioned here. And remember, two years ago, they were in the NLCS with a much different group, admittedly. But... I could see them going on a run here. If you look at their starting pitching, just that alone, who besides the Phillies is even in their league in the National League? I don't know that you can mention any other team along those lines. All right, then let me flip it over. Yeah. Did we just get a little playoff winner prediction in the National League from Junior there? I mean, (laughs) no one's in Phillies league, so we know who he doesn't make predictions. He just did. He likes the Padres and the Phillies. That's who he likes. I said no one else is in their league except for the in the Phillies league. So I said their starting rotation, no one else is in their league. You need to listen, (laughs) sir. (laughs) What hey, what do you think about the Milwaukee Brewers? So they get to chill, hang out, and enjoy winning all season long. As you always say, if you don't like it, win more. And that's what they did. So they watched the chaos. They welcome in a Mets team that they just faced, and they've run all over them this year. So what do you think about this series coming up? I love Milwaukee. I love the way they play. I love their whole ethic, the undaunted motto, the whole thing. It's really cool. And to see how far they've come after losing Council and Burns and Woodruff and Devin Williams at the start of the season and Yelich later in the season, it's rather amazing. They play the game correctly. They are the best base running team in the majors, according to Fangraph. They're one of the top defensive teams, according to all the advanced metrics. Offensively, they can be a little bit challenged at times, but they run all over the place. 17 for 17 in six games against the Mets in stolen base attempts this season. So they're an interesting group. Now, we talk about starting pitching. It's not a killer rotation. There's no doubt about that. They're going to go Freddy Peralta in game one. I would assume Montas or some type of glorified bullpen game in game two, and who knows in game three. But Their bullpen is the best in the National League statistically. I know I mentioned the Padres, but when you look at the numbers, the Brewers are up there at the top, right behind the Guardians in the majors. So I like the Brewers. I also like the Mets right now. And after they kind of got the monkey off their back, if you want to call it that, yesterday, it's a surge of momentum that they're riding, a, a euphoric surge here. So I can see this going either way. Sorry, AJ, no prediction. (laughs) <laughs> uh, yes, AJ. AJ loves your predictions, so he's changing his locks based on who you're picking. So, <laughs> changing my locks. Do you have any update on rosters? Obviously, the early game rosters are out; those teams are set, but we don't know even who's starting for the Braves in Game One. And it may be from what I thought you wrote, or maybe someone else wrote. It may be possibly that there's two guys that aren't even on the 40-man roster right now that could start for the Braves in game one. Well, a couple of things here, Eric. And smith Shaver and Elder are on the roster. And it appears that one of them will start today. I don't know how they're going to get through today. Honestly, they've got that problem at the front of the game. And they've got another problem at the back of the game because Jimenez and Iglesias both pitched in both games of the doubleheader yesterday. As far as rosters are concerned, the one thing that I thought was really cool this morning in seeing the rosters come out was so many of the players who are questionable are on rosters. Vinny Pasquantino for the Royals. He's back about two weeks sooner than expected from his broken thumb. Sal Freelich from the Brewers. When he crashed into that wall Saturday, I thought he was down for at least the wild card series. He is on the Brewers roster. And the biggest one, Jordan Alvarez with the Astros. He's on their roster. He's been dealing with a knee issue. So... We're going to get the best of these guys, and I know they might be physically compromised, some of them, but we're going to see them at least on the field, and that's really cool. As I wrote 
in that story today, what's really interesting about this postseason and intriguing about it is we're seeing really almost all of the game's biggest stars on this stage. It doesn't happen that often. Of course, it hasn't happened with Otani and Trout for a long time. So that aspect of it makes it really interesting to me, and it should be a lot of fun. All right, Ken, I got to ask you this. How do the Braves win this series? I mean, no sale on the roster. You just mentioned all their problems in the back end of the bullpen. They haven't really hit all year. You know, they don't know who's starting game one. Obviously, Freed game two is a good one for them. But is there a way the Braves can win this? Because you mentioned the Padres. They're sitting back. They're lined up. They've got their pitching set. Their lineup's been swinging it great. This seems like, man, the Padres two and done. Braves are going to go home. Oh, we had a nice year. We'll try again next year. I'm having a really hard time seeing how they are going to win this series. And the only chance I would give them is that they're the Atlanta Braves and they found ways to get here despite all of the obstacles that were in their way. And we can recount them. It's been an incredible run of injuries. Strider and Acuna and Riley being the biggest of them. Albies for a while. We can go on and on. Playing three release players in their lineup. It's incredible that they're here. Now, the way they win is probably... Maybe today, I wouldn't say punt the game. You don't punt a playoff game. But you're obviously going to have to hold back Iglesias and Jimenez. I don't see how they can pitch today. Unless you have a lead, maybe then you take your shot. But you play for games two and three. For Freed and Ronaldo Lopez. And you hope that maybe you can pull it out that way. But it's going to be really difficult. They're not going to concede, obviously. They're the Atlanta Braves. No team concedes. But at the same time, they're in really tough here. And... Hats off to them, though, just to get to this point and be in the playoffs, considering all that they've faced this year, is kind of amazing. Um, Ken, I wanted to go to the Baltimore Orioles for a moment. I think that series is fascinating. I mean, especially with game one, Cole Reagans is really good. I mean, that is really why you sign one year players. Last year, for example, with the Royals on a Chapman deal and get yourself a Cole Reagans to start game one of a playoff series a year later. And then meanwhile, it's Corbin Burns who looks like he fixed whatever the problem was with the cutter back in August. But the Orioles have been very 500-ish for a while. So what do you think this series looks like heading into it? Can the Orioles, as you put it, I think, snap out of this funk? So far, so good. And when I say that, in the last week and a half of the season, they showed signs of snapping out of that funk. And Westberg is back now. He hasn't hit yet, but he is back. And they've got Urias back as well. He is a player who's kind of valuable for them. And as you said, they've got Burns and Eflin and then Dean Kramer in game three if necessary. Seven and three in their last 10 games. They've hit better. They've looked more like the team that they were in the first half of the season. Now, this series, to me, might be the most closely contested of the four, just for the reasons you mentioned. The Royals are a team that struggles offensively and has down the stretch, but here comes Pasquantino back. We'll see how he is. They have the best player on the field, Bobby Witt Jr. The Orioles have the second best player, Gunnar Henderson, or maybe it's 1-1A. One one it's going to be a fascinating matchup. Now, I like the Orioles because they're at home, and I like them because they have Burns and Eflin here, but at the same time, Nothing would surprise me in this series. It would not surprise me if the Royals did really well. It just seems to me that the Orioles might be regaining their mojo. Maybe I'm putting too much on that 7-3 and three stretch, but it was against teams that were not bad. The Detroit Tigers, the New York Yankees. We'll see how this goes, but it looks again like they are kind of getting back in the flow a little bit. And they'll obviously have a very enthusiastic home crowd at Camden Yards. You've mentioned it a little bit here. You mentioned it to a, to a large, longer extent in your article about how the best players in the game right now are in the playoffs, and that's what we want. First time since, I forget what year you said, 80-something, where the National League MVP, Cy Young, all that stuff was in these games. Is this saying something about our game in the sense that, well, if you don't have one of these good players, you're not going to make the playoffs, or is it just a – well, the expanded playoffs is because the last time was in the 81 season when it was a shortened season and more teams made the playoffs. Right, Eric, I'll explain what I wrote. And it's a little bit complicated, but basically 81 was the last time, the only time we've ever seen in one postseason, the eventual MVPs, eventual Cy Youngs, and eventual rookies of the year 
in, again, one postseason. Now, it might not happen this season either if Paul Skeens wins National League Rookie of the Year, but everyone else is here. Everyone else is involved. To me, it's more a reflection of the expanded playoffs than anything else. But at the same time, you look at Milwaukee and what they have done without a star. Okay, that's one way to do it. But then you look at Cleveland. They've got a superstar, Jose Ramirez. And it always helps to have a superstar. And actually, Milwaukee has one too. He just happens to be hurt in Christian Yelich. You do need those players to win. And there's no question about that. But this is only possible because the expanded playoffs have consisted of 12 teams for the third straight year now and you creating more opportunity for the stars to get there and also it helped to get Otani out of the Angels situation that is the key thing here Ken let's get to some you know non-playoff stuff just a couple topics here looks like Buster Posey's getting three years on the president of baseball operations deal and Pete Putilla was let go so they're going to let him Kind of make some changes there. After 24 hours here, anything else that we should digest with San Francisco that we're learning about? I know we covered it a little bit yesterday too. Well, the Patilla move is interesting, and I'll tell you why. I thought initially maybe he would stay because Buster Posey is going to need some people who are administrators, guys who know the rules, who can do things, who just are people who serve a valuable function in the front office, keeping things going. The fact that he doesn't want him, Patilla is a guy who came from the Astros, and wants to start anew just shows the extent of the change that they're going to make. It's going to be a sweeping change. Buster Posey clearly wants his own people in there, and that's understandable. This is very common. It's going to be really interesting to see who he hires as general manager. He has a network, of course. He has numerous connections in baseball, but will he hire someone, I don't know, who was a former player like himself? I kind of doubt it. Or an established executive, someone who may be out of work now or working for another team. That to me is what he needs. He's going to need that know-how. He has the vision, I am sure. He is really smart. We all know that. And I would imagine Buster Posey, among all people, knows how to put together a winning franchise in his mind. That said, the mechanics of doing that, making the trades, leading an organization, all of the things that go into being a president of baseball operations, he doesn't have the expertise in many of those areas, and that's where he's going to need the help. Listen, everybody, we got a major problem here. Half of our viewers are not subscribed. Let's go. All you got to do is click a button, check it out, hit that button. The problem will be gone. Let's go. Get super busy and getting back on a good fall workout routine needs to be easy for me. With Anytime Fitness being available anytime, anywhere, they make it easy to work on getting stronger and more confident into my schedule. Kratz is spot on. It's got to be easy to make that routine happen, and that's why we love Anytime Fitness with access to 5,000-plus well-equipped gyms open 24-7, and this is not your average gym experience. They also provide personalized coaching support that provides members the best training, nutrition, and recovery guidance, which includes the Anytime Fitness app that generates personalized workout plans and tracks your daily progress. Get after it, FT fam. To claim your free Anytime Fitness trial pass, visit anytimefitness.com and get yours today. We'll also drop that link in the description of this episode. Check out more info and claim that free trial pass at Anytime Fitness. Is this a change though, Ken? So what I want to know, is this the, the beginning of it turning from guys that never played from Harvard and Ivy League schools to now teams are starting to look at more at former players? And listen, I hope Buster Posey does great, but he has no experience at this. He has absolutely right. – he, he's done nothing. <clears throat> Excuse me. At least I'll give Chris Getz credit. He did worked in the minor leagues for a bunch of years, so he kind of had an idea how some things work. But Buster Posey's been a specialist assistant to the owner, basically. Right? And he would come in. But to, to take him and say, you're president of baseball ops, you can hire the front office. Like, are they going to give him carte blanche on the credit card to go out and get free agents? Are they going to give him carte blanche to go get the GM, you know, the manager, whoever he wants? Because, listen, hire me. I'd love to have an open credit card and be able to go out and say, oh, Buster, you want me to go get – who's a free agent? Oh, Juan Soto? Oh, give me the credit card. We'll do it. AJ, these are all great questions. And they're questions that fans have, media has right now about – the way the Giants are going to operate. I don't know the answers to a lot of that, but from the way you described it, that's the way I feel about it. There's some risk here. You have a franchise legend, admittedly, 
a great model for the organization and for baseball. He's someone that we all kind of look up to, right? But that doesn't mean he can be a president of baseball operations. And it doesn't mean he's going to succeed in a role in which he has zero experience. I kind of equate it to some of the managers who have come in without experience either. Now, some of them have done quite well. And maybe that will be the case for Buster Posey. But I would suggest that running a franchise as a president of baseball operations is a heck of a lot more complex than managing a team. I'm not trying to discredit managers, but running a team with hundreds of employees and keeping the farm system going and international scouting and all of the different things that are entailed beyond the major league roster. Wow, it's a lot and he's going to need help, but I assume they have a plan. Javier Lopez, his former teammate, the Giants reliever, was quoted in Andrew Baggerly's story as saying today, he's not doing this unless he has a vision of how he wants to go about it. And we know that from Buster Posey. So I am fascinated to see how this is going to turn out. And will it start a trend to answer your question? I don't know. Perhaps it depends on how he fares to see whether other teams will follow suit. But keep in mind, AJ, too, how many teams have a guy like Buster Posey? Someone who was in their organization his entire career, someone who is that model type player, and someone who wants to do this. It doesn't seem like there are many guys who would qualify by that description. No, but one thing I do enjoy about this is the Giants keep their guys around. For certain organizations, I mentioned them, they don't keep their guys around. Guys that won for them, guys that did a lot of things for them, they don't keep them around and they don't value their insight, whereas the Giants do. The Giants trust their guys, they find their guys, and they usually keep their guys especially after they won those World Series. I mean, they kept guys that probably shouldn't have signed. They signed them because they helped them, right? There are certain other organizations, and you can name them, Ken, if you go through it, that don't value that. And the Giants value their their guys. There's no question. And, AJ, along these same lines, one of the things that has been lost in the game over the past, I don't know, 10, 15 years with the rise of the analytical movement is the trust in the expertise of experience in players like Buster Posey, even in executives who are maybe older, that has to end. That has to be something that gets addressed where there's more balance. I've talked about this before. No one is saying that analytics should go away. No one in their right minds would say that. Analytics are extremely valuable in the game. They've helped players, they've helped teams. They inform us in ways that we never imagined. But there is a human element. There is a balance that must be struck. Guys like Posey can help strike that balance. He had all the numbers when he was playing. He was not that far removed from that kind of era. He played under the Farhan Zaidi, Gabe Kapler regime. So he knows where that value lies and where it may not. And you know what? At times, if the value from the analytics is not as valuable as the scouting perspective, that's okay. Smart teams are using both and incorporating both. And I said this yesterday, teams give a lot of lip service to how they're a combination and how we value all the information. It's not true. And we can see that by the way they conduct themselves, by the scouts that they fire, and just by the way they operate. So that is my hope for the game, that the old school expertise becomes again more in fashion along with the analytics and that teams kind of look at both in a balanced way and then make their decisions. Yeah, we see Posey, you know, he's speaking today or now recently here. I value scouts very much, mm-hmm. trying to get the balance back a little bit. Obviously, this is like, you know, you break up with someone and you try and date someone who's but the good, very different. The really good teams, though, <laughs> use both. Yes, uh, of listen, course. The Astros kind of went away from it, but they even brought back scouts, right? Mm-hmm. Like, there's no team out there that is good that just is like, we're just going to use, you know, whatever system it is analytically. And analytics are That's great. That's true, but there Do are you know some what? teams, AJ, there are some teams that – have the percentage of influence much higher toward the analytical side. Not so many now, not so many now that have the percentage toward the scouting side. No, but some are maybe 80, 20, however you want to break it down. And again, those teams are missing. Those teams are at a competitive disadvantage because there is things that happen on the field, things that scouts see, things that players, managers, coaches see, farm directors see that aren't necessarily measurable. And that's what drives analytic people crazy, analytical people crazy. Oh, you can't measure it. No, sometimes you can't measure it, but it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Yeah, this topic drives fans crazy too. That's why it's important to talk about. Ken, last thing, and if you haven't seen it yet, we can save it for next time or for Fair Territory on Thursday. Did you see Ken Kendrick's comments about Jordan Montgomery? 
Okay. I did. Do you want to let us know your thoughts? Because he slammed Monty and said, it's all my fault and essentially said it was an awful investment and he was terrible. I don't necessarily agree with an owner coming out and just ripping a player like that, but he's also ripping himself. And he's saying that the mistake was his. And I remember I wrote a pretty long story about him early in the season after they signed Montgomery in which I asked him about raising payroll after the World Series and the move to get Montgomery and the thinking behind it. And obviously he was all for it. He had to approve that deal. Now, when it doesn't work out, to me, the classy thing to do is simply say nothing and move on. That's what, I don't know, 95% of the teams do. This was a case where he kind of went too far, in my opinion. Actually, not kind of. He went too far, in my opinion. He just should have left well enough alone and taken responsibility himself. That would have been the more dignified way to go about it. And Jordan Montgomery, I'm sure, would agree. He didn't have a great year. He knows he didn't have a great year. And we'll see what happens with him next year. Yeah, and right now he's still on the team. So yeah, he's he got the vesting option. In. He can opt in. Yeah, he can opt in. Yeah. So he continued, yeah. And maybe, and listen, maybe that's the motivation here, right? Maybe Kendrick's trying to tell him don't opt in. I believe Jordan Montgomery can probably do better than the $25 million on the open market anyway in a multi-year deal, so he should opt out. But maybe this is what sealed it. I don't agree with that kind of tactic. I don't think, again, it's the classic way to go, but that might be the game that Kendrick is playing here. Mm -hmm. You know, some of his colleagues have certainly set the bar low recently. So I feel like he's like, eh, he's Very true. Player. <laughs> you've got a guy just crapping on a city right now. So Ken, thank you. And most importantly, happy postseason. Uh, great to start the playoffs here. I'm excited Ken, about it. Ken, do you know where you're going yet? AJ, you tell me. You always seem to have more information about where we're going. <laughs> do you know where you're going? I have a hunch, but I don't know. I can't. I don't know for sure. Can't disclose. We don't know yet. I've heard okay. rumors. And what we're talking know. about for people who are watching who have no idea what we're talking about. AJ works on one Fox crew in the division series. I work on another, and we have not gotten our assignments yet. It seems to me it depends on if the Mets advance, how this all plays out, and whatever decisions our bosses make. No, yeah. Ken will pick whatever. No, but that makes sense. No, it's New York. York. Ken will yeah. not pick what. No, no, no. We're not doing that at this time of year. He knows that. He's just he's trolling me. <laughs> yes, it's not Ken's decision. But the Mets are in New York. It's the number one market that plays a factor in. Yeah, but Philly is also a big market. That's, That's true. The key. But the Mets. So is LA. Big. Come yeah, on up. Is LA and, and you can go golfing with me. You can go Here, golfing. Here's Ken. the good news. Come on. Here's the good news. Yeah. Yeah, by fair territory on Thursday, we might know. So stay tuned there. You'll see Ken on that. Might. Ken, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, might. Friday at the latest. So thank you, Ken. We'll talk soon. Thanks, guys. To, uh, fair territory popping up again on Thursday, 1230 Eastern. So if you have more questions, whether it's about playoff teams or non-playoff teams, I thought there was a lot of news here flying around right now. You can save some of that and dish it out to Ken and Alana on Thursday on the FT YouTube channel. Hey, everybody. Be sure to like and subscribe for more content. We're back here every weekday, all year long, so do not miss an episode. The videos are coming in all day. Here's another video you might enjoy. Baseball the way it should be covered.